Well, I want to start out this evening uh, showing you something, just a, a brief illustration here. You know, sometimes when, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we can go through life as Christians, and we can go through there, but not with a lot of joy, not with a lot of fire in our, in our lives. And... Uh, I've got here what's called a Rubens tube. Basically, we've got a speaker on one end, and the speaker basically puts the sound through the, the pipe. I've also got some propane coming in here that allows there to be some flames. And this is the way it is. That, that propane almost represents the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit being in our lives, we can see that there is evidence, there is a flame burning. But the problem is, as many of us are satisfied with just that. And for me... I want more than just to be saved. I want to be able to live a life worthy of the calling. I want to be able to go out and evangelize for, for Christ. And the creation message for me has been something that has taken a life that looks like this and made it a life that's, that's a lot more exciting, a life that is a lot more, well, uh, I guess, on fire. Watch what happens when we put a little bit of music here to, through this. of a beat. That's just the Rubens too. But you see, this is what I'm hoping is going to happen to you tonight. That you're going to go from something like this to something that's alive, that's something that's excited, someone who is ready to go out and preach the gospel, knowing that we can stand on the word of God and that it is true, that we can be faithful to that because God has been faithful to us. What I might do is uh, see if maybe a couple of you can maybe uh, come and move this out of the way, and I will just continue here while you move that out. I want you to look at this picture here. What's missing in this picture? Now this is a, something that uh, Ken Ham's answers in Genesis had, but I think it's a great illustration. What's missing here? Just in case some of you are a little bit tired here tonight, maybe I'll help you out. How many of you thought it was A? Or perhaps B? C? Maybe D? Or maybe some of you even thought E? There you go, yeah, most of you thought E. Some of you, maybe even something I haven't even shown you here, F. Well, guess what? You're all wrong. Nothing was missing. You see, it was drawn this way. It was drawn the way it was meant to be drawn, but I brainwashed you. Yeah, you, you guys have all been brainwashed. I guarantee it. Every one of you have been brainwashed. I mean, think of it. Uh, you guys probably think sports are important because they help build what? Character. Right, sports helps build character. Do you guys believe that lie? Really? Sports builds character? Guys, if sports builds character, then the NFL and the NBA ought to be teaming with it. Sports does not build character. God's Word builds character. That's why in the NFL and the NBA, it's Christian athletes that are the ones that have character, aren't they? Yeah. Sports doesn't build it. God's Word does. I'm not against sports. I'm just against saying that sports builds character. I mean, it can help build discipline, it can help build teamwork, absolutely, but it doesn't build character. Only God's Word can do that. All of us have been brainwashed. Prehistoric, you name something prehistoric for me. You'd probably say something like a dinosaur or a woolly mammoth. Well, guys, no, there is no such thing as prehistoric. Pre means before, historic means history. There is nothing before history. My Bible records it from the start. 
no such thing as prehistoric. That word did not even exist in our early dictionaries. It wasn't even there. That is a brainwashing term. Or they'll brainwash you and they'll say, well, uh, do you think humans are still evolving? Those are actually questions called critical thinking questions in our textbooks. Do you think humans are still evolving? Well, if you say yes, you've been brainwashed. If you say no, <laughs> you've been brainwashed. You see, that's, there's no right answer to that question. That's like me saying, hey, Pastor Miller, have you stopped taking illegal drugs yet? <laughs> see, if he says yes, it means he used to take drugs. If he says no, I'm taking drugs. There is no right answer to that question. When they ask you the question, do you think humans are still evolving? Yes means they are, no means they once were. That does not teach your children how to think. It tells them what to think. And this is how they brainwash you. Likewise, how do we get brainwashed? Because of what I've just shown you. I gave you a presupposition that something was missing. You therefore put on a pair of glasses to come up with an interpretation based on the question, what was missing? Your interpretation was totally consistent with your glasses. It was totally consistent with the presupposition. The problem is it was just totally wrong, wasn't it? Yeah, totally wrong. I made you think the way I wanted you to think about the evidence. When I asked you the question, what was missing, you should have said this. You asked me a question, what's missing? I should question this question. But most of us don't even know it's a question, let alone to question the question, let alone to ask the right question to ask about the question. Did you follow that? Yeah. Well, put another way is this. They find a new rock in the paper. They say it's millions of years old. And you go, wow. Don't go, wow. Ask yourself, what questions were used or asked to get that interpretation? And if you don't know what questions were asked, how do you know what questions to ask to question their question? To see if they're asking the right questions. And the more we study, the more we see we need to ask some questions. It's going to be a long night, isn't it? No. I won't confuse you anymore. A practical example of this is missing links. What do they find? Nothing. Hence the word missing, right? Yeah, you see, when I asked you the question what was missing, you put on a pair of glasses to try and find it. When they say there's a missing link, you're putting on a pair of glasses to try and go find something that's missing. What if nothing's missing? Then there's no missing link. This is sad, but this is what's going on. We're being duped by little things like this. I want to describe here this evening a theory based on what the Bible says. It's called the firmament or the canopy theory. Now, I am not going to be dogmatic about this. I want you to know that what I'm describing here tonight, science does can, can support it, but it can't prove it. Likewise, the Bible can't prove exactly what I'm going to say in all of it because we're adding science into it. But nonetheless, you put science and the Bible together, there's a nice little theory that comes about that does seem to fit science and answer all these so-called contradictions that we see or problems in the Bible. There are some that do not like the canopy theory out there. One of the problems is we don't know the heat. It might get too hot. But some think there could have been some differences in the sun or maybe there's some things we just don't know about. You know, it could just be a divine thing. Who knows? But nonetheless, uh, answers in Genesis for a while kind of abandoned the canopy theory. Now some are bringing it in. Some like uh, Larry Vardaman, he still believes that there's a good possibility that the, you know, the canopy theory is there. We just don't have all the answers to it. But none of them do. We don't have all the answers for any theory. I think this is the one that answers the most questions. So I don't want to fall into the same evolutionary trap that many of my evolutionary friends do and say, you know, this is the way it was, you know, I don't know. I can only give you a theory. You decide, you do more research, but I think that as you'll see as we put these things together, it makes sense. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, it tells us that on the second day of creation, God separates the waters, and he does so horizontally and vertically. Horizontally, he creates dry land and water. The word there for land is a single dry land mass. I do believe in Pangaea, that single land mass. He also separates the waters vertically. He puts water up above in the sky and water underneath the ground. You might picture it looking something like this here, where you have this canopy, this firmament. The Bible calls it rakia in Hebrew. It implies a, a crystallized 
flattening out, stretching out aspect. Again, I don't know if this is exactly what it looked like, but it might have looked something like this. I don't know if it was water vapor, liquid water, ice crystals. Josephus, a historian around the time of Christ, says that this was a crystalline firmament. Again, right or wrong, I don't know. But from a cross section of the earth, it would look something like this. You'd have the earth, the waters underneath the earth, the crust of the earth above those waters, and then you see the firmament up above that. Another question that people have is how could this thing be held up? Well, one of the ways it may have been held up is by a process called superconductive material. You can see here on this little video, this is showing you superconductive material. Sometimes at our science camps we will do this. Take superconductive material and superfreeze it using liquid nitrogen. Hydrogen, which is in water, H2O, becomes superconductive when it is supercooled. Now it's not magnetism. As you can see, he can take this and he can put it at different locations above the magnet. He can take it at an angle above the magnet. He can put it off to the side and it will twist and it, it locks on an axis. They even call it locking. This is also known as the Meisner effect. It's being used today for superconducting coils for trains in Japan, things like that. But we're, we're trying to find new areas of where this might work. But what I want to do is not focus on the technology as much as show you that perhaps this is how the firmament could have been held up above the earth. All the waters that came from the flood certainly didn't come from the, the firmament. But what we would see is the earth is like a big magnet. Hydrogen in water, superfreeze it, which it would be way up on top in those higher atmospheric areas, could become superconductive. Therefore, you can put this upside down, right side up, it makes no difference that that firmament could have simply been locked in place above the earth as a big magnet and held there. I don't know. It's just one possible explanation of how maybe it was up there. It's not crazy to propose such a thing could happen because we have planets today like Jupiter, Venus, Saturn, all have types of canopies over their planets. It's just that this one had water. That's all we're saying. Now with that firmament there, however, we would have a very different world to live in, a different atmosphere. Because it would be, first of all, like a greenhouse. So you would have a subtropical climate, something like the Caribbean year-round. There would be seasonal changes, no question, but they wouldn't be as drastic as what we would see here in the Midwest. We also know that the Bible says there was no rain before Noah's flood, it seems. In Genesis 2, verse 5 and 6, it says the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth. Well, how did everything get watered if there's no rain? Well, look what verse 6 says. Streams came up from the surface of the earth. And they watered the whole ground, the whole surface of the ground. It sounds like underground aquifers were bubbling up and watering everything. By the way, that is just what Genesis describes and shows us in the Garden of Eden. There was this huge aquifer, and from it, the center of it, in the center of the garden, an aquifer bubbles up and waters the whole surface. There are four rivers that break off from this one aquifer. That is a big aquifer to have four rivers break off from it. So the description is even seen in the Garden of Eden. We also know that there would be no solar radiation. Water filters out the harmful rays of the sun so you could go outside and not get a sunburn because you'd be protected from that short wave radiation. We would also have more oxygen and air pressure. More air pressure because NASA has measured atmospheric gases in outer space 200 miles. Those gases would have been compressed underneath this canopy, increasing the pressure. We believe about twice the atmospheric pressure. We also would have had about 28 to 30 percent oxygen compared to today's 16 to 19 percent. Now, most of our textbooks will tell us 21%, but the textbooks seem, uh, or the scientists seem to be in the 16 to 19%. Going back to this no rain here real quick, I want you to also see something here. Uh, I've got another demonstration that I'd like to show you. Um, what, what happens with pressure? Why would we have no rain? Because no high and low air pressure systems could form with that, which would not allow clouds to form, which would not allow rain to form. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to grab a 
two liter bottle and a little bike tire pump. I'm going to stick this bike tire pump onto the two liter bottle to increase the pressure here. So as I do that, watch what will happen here. There's a high pressure in here. Now when pressure changes, watch what happens. Clouds form, right? If you don't have high and low air pressure systems, you're not going to have clouds forming. That may be why we don't see clouds forming or rain in the pre-flood atmosphere. Just again, a possibility is all. Changes in pressure create that cloud formation. I want you to know that even an evolutionist believes what I have just told you. If you read in your textbooks, they will tell you that billions of years ago, for millions of years, there was no rain on the earth. They will tell you there was a tropical paradise at the time of the dinosaurs. That's why you see the vegetation you do in the fossil record. They will tell you that we had radiation. I agree. I'm just saying we were protected from it. They will tell you that we had more pressure and oxygen. Why? Well, because we find fossilized amber, which is tree sap that has gone down the tree slowly. Here are some amber that I have. Sometimes you will see inside air bubbles, even insects in there. We simply go in and measure what's inside those air bubbles, and we see more oxygen. That's the atmosphere that was captured as it would roll down the side of a tree. That's all that happens. Here's another one. And isn't that crazy? This mosquito forgot to evolve in 144 million years, they say that this thing is. Looks just like the ones we have today. So I agree with what they're saying. It's, the only difference is this, the timing and the cause. They're saying this atmosphere was millions and billions of years ago, and they don't have any idea as to why. I'm saying it was about 6,000 years ago. And the reason why is because of this firmament. That's why the world is the way it was before the flood. So again, it's a theory, but it, it's one that seems to fit. They, have, they agree with the science. They agree with the, the, the conditions. It's just the timing and the cause that are different. In Genesis chapter 7, it tells us that on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of heaven were opened, and the rain fell on the earth forty days and forty nights. At the time of the flood, those fountains of the great deep burst forth. That's where the flood waters came from, most of it. And then it says the floodgates of heaven, the Hebrew there is like a dam breaking. Those waters came down in the form of rain for forty days and forty nights. Don't you think that with the fountains of the great deep breaking open, you're going to have all kinds of volcanoes and earthquakes going on? That'll be important later. It would explain why there was no rainbow. If there was no rain before Noah's flood, no rainbow, right? That makes sense. So where did the flood waters of Noah come from? The waters above came down. The waters underneath came up. It wasn't just rain. It, most of it probably came from the waters underneath. You might picture it looking something like this. When the continents split, the water shooting up into the sky, causing plate tectonics. The continent splitting. Maybe this mid-oceanic ridge is where the fountains of the great deep were breaking open. There's even secular science supporting this pre-flood environment. We see in Genesis chapter 10, verse 25, it says, Unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. Some people think that this could be plate tectonics. I don't believe it is. Because this is after the Tower of Babel, well after the flood. There's no reason to say that it could happen at that time. I believe this is actually taking place in the post-Ice Age. I believe this is probably what happened. It would make sense scientifically and biblically. You see, if you would lower the oceans today by 150 feet, there is enough water that would be taken up in ice in the Ice Age. Lower it 150 feet, continents today are connected. Just by lowering it 150 feet. 
So if the ice age was right after the flood, which we will get to in a moment, I believe it was, the oceans would be lowered, these land bridges would connect continents, that would allow the animals after the flood to be able to get two different continents, as well as people. God said, fill the earth, be fruitful and multiply, and they decide that they want to go to the Tower of Babel and stay there, so that's what they do. God wasn't pleased, they were trying to worship the heavens, they weren't spreading out like he said. So he confuses their languages and they spread out. How did they get from one continent to the other? Probably using those land bridges. And then, time-wise, this would be about perfect. In the days of Peleg, perhaps that ice age was going away. The ice was melting, the oceans are rising up, and the earth would be divided population-wise so that they couldn't get back and do what they were doing at the Tower of Babel. And this explains why we would find pyramids and things like that on more than one continent. Because that information from the Tower of Babel that was common was taken with them. But in any case, the earth was divided at the time of Peleg. Now, the Tower of Babel is very important for us to understand a lot of different things. One of which is that all of these Stone Age, Bronze Age, you know, Iron Age type things that we see in archaeology... Did you know that 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 has never been found anywhere complete? We don't see it nice and neat anywhere. What we see is a piece of it over here and a piece of it over there, and they just interpret it that way. But this is what I would expect to see if the Bible was true. You see, if you're going to take and take all of you guys here, and we're going to divide you up into groups of five or six, and then nobody else is on the world, and we're going to take you and send you off there. And by the way, you can't drive. You're going to have to walk or, you know, take carts and things like that. Chances are you're not going to take your big screen TV, will you? No, you're going to have to carry this stuff. So what you're going to do is you're going to take only the necessary things. Hammers probably will stay back too. Because you know what? A rock will do just fine. And that's what they did. They traveled and as they went places, they would use rocks for hammers. And then when they left, you know what? Let's just leave them there. I don't want to carry rocks with me. And and so they would leave evidence of what is called the Stone Age. They weren't smart enough to develop tools. It wasn't that they were too dumb to do that. It was they were too smart to carry them. Okay? And then what's going to happen is, in some cases, they'll just live in caves and things like that. People say, cavemen. You know, what, hey, well, you know what? David was a caveman. He lived in caves while he was hiding out. Hunters were cavemen. There are cavemen in Australia today. They just have TVs in their caves. It just fit their needs. Cavemen went, you know, stupid people sitting around fires going, fire, fire. No, they were very intelligent. The caves just fit their needs, that's all. As they are moving along, the earth was plentiful at that time, and so these people would probably just eat what the trees and the things like that would give them. They're just going to, to, to eat what the land produces. And so what you would have is evidence of a hunter and gatherer mentality. Not because they were too stupid to plant a garden, they were too smart. Why weed a garden when the land is producing it for you? And then they're going to continue to move on. Eventually, they'll grow, and they're going to settle in a place, and then they will plant a garden. And then what's going to happen is maybe some of you took information about how to make metals with you. Maybe some of you were more peaceful than others. And so you'd have these other people that had metals come in and conquer these, this city that didn't have metals, and it would leave evidence of a more intelligent civilization on top of a less intelligent civilization. Well, it wasn't that one was more intelligent or less intelligent, one just maybe had, uh, had different kinds of technology, or in some cases, some just maybe were more violent. Others didn't feel they needed swords and whatever. Who knows? But the point is, is that the Bible explains why you would see some of those things. And it would also explain why in some cases you see what look like Stone Age on top of the others. It, it doesn't fit nicely. If evolution is true, it should be nice and neat all over the place, but it isn't like that. So the Tower of Babel explains that as well. It says in Psalms 24, verses 1 through 2, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world that they dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas, he established it upon the floods. He created this world upon waters, which by the way is the opposite of what evolution says. Waters don't come till later. But the Bible says God created it upon the waters. He stretched out the earth above the waters in Psalm 136. By the way, this is also the stretching out. He also says many times in Scripture that he stretched out the heavens. That's why we get this big bang idea, is we see the red shift of light. 
the red shift is moving away from us. Okay? Well, that means that we must be at the center, first of all, which doesn't seem to make much sense for an evolutionist because it seems that we are at a special location then. But I don't believe that it's evidence that the Big Bang, you had this atomic particle blowing up, and that's why you're seeing things moving away. We're seeing this because God stretched out the heavens, and that's why we see things at the redshift. So you want to know distant starlight. There's a number of different explanations of why we see starlight that should be millions of light years away. One possibility of many is that if you take a balloon, put two dots on it, now blow the balloon up. Those two dots now stretch out, get further apart very quickly. I believe that God created everything closer and then he stretched out the heavens. That's why we see the red shift of light. Like I said, there are other scientific explanations. We've got some DVDs on our website that will go through more of that, but just to give you a little taste of that here for now. Nonetheless, the earth was created above the waters. I believe in Noah's flood. I believe that it covered the highest mountain by 20 feet of water. But there are liberal theologians out there who are trying to tell you, oh no, that couldn't happen. There's not enough water on earth to cover the highest mountain by 20 feet. Where'd all the water go? Please, as a Christian, don't go and tell people that you believe Noah's flood was a global flood because you're going to look silly and, and they're not going to listen to the gospel then. Guys, if the Bible says it, I believe it. And I'm going to stand on the word rather than your scientific philosophies. And just because you don't understand how God did something doesn't mean he couldn't do it. It just means he's smarter than you. Would you do me a favor? If you don't under understand how God did something or you know why he did something, would you at least give the Holy Spirit the honor of being a little more learned than you are? Yeah, I'm glad that I can't explain how God did everything he did, why God did everything he did, because if I could, you know what that would make me? God. And I want to serve a God that's so much bigger than this little pea brain right here. So where did the water go? Well, before I answer that question, I want you to know that NASA is proposing that there was a global flood on the planet Mars. Now you tell me how much water has been found on Mars. Not a liquid drop, huh? Yet they're saying there was a flood on a planet that doesn't have any water. Yet when I say there was a flood on Earth that is 70% water, I'm crazy? It sounds to me like there's a bias here, don't you think? I do believe that there was water on Mars, but only in this sense right here. That's the only water on Mars I believe in. Now, by the way, it is possible that there could have been water in the past on Mars. That's not scientifically... Uh, you know, unreliable. My point is simply that how come I can't propose a flood here? How come they're so adamant that there was one there but not one here? Okay, comets could have hit Mars, causing water, causing floods, things like that. There are explanations, but we're not going to get into that here for now. But if Noah's flood was just a local flood like these liberal theologians want to try and do because they want to believe in the Bible, you know. So they say, well, it wasn't a global flood. It was just local over in Mesopotamia somewhere. Well, if that's the case, why didn't God just say, hey, Noah, move? <laughs> Wouldn't that be easier? Why did he take birds on the ark? They could have flapped their wings to get to the next dry hillside. And the rainbow God put in the sky, wouldn't that make him a liar? He said, I'll never do such a thing again. And yet we've had that tsunami, Katrina, and many other local floods. Hurricane Sandy. That would make him a liar. And the Bible says in 2 Peter, it connects Noah's flood to judgment at the end of the world. If it was just a local flood, maybe a local judgment when the Lord returns, huh? No, it was a global flood. Do you know that the Hebrew and Greek even have special terms, words for Noah's flood, Mabul, Kataklusmos, to separate it from other floods? This was a global flood. Not to mention 